Welcome back to Real Talk with Susan Stone and Christina Supler. We are full-time moms and attorneys bringing our student defense legal practice to life with real, candid conversations. It has been approximately one year since the Dobbs opinion, and I'm still in shock. Are you? I, it was interesting over the weekend reading news stories, and it's like, wow, a year has passed, and it, it's wild. Wild. Yeah, it's changing the election. It's changing culture. Uh, we are really reverting back. And so the topic today is more important than ever. We're going to talk about contraception post dogs, and we're going to hopefully unpack myths and make sure students know what they need to do to be safe out there. You know, last week we had a guest and we were talking about the health issues of transgender. We actually learned a new word, LARC. Remember that? I do. And I'm certain that our guest today has more to say. I think she knows a lark is not a bird. It's a long-acting reversible contraception. But today we have a repeat guest that we love to see. Yes, today we are really happy to be joined again by Dr. Lauren Stryker. Welcome, Dr. Stryker. Welcome back, I should say. Welcome back. Dr. Lauren Stryker is a clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Northwestern University's Medical School, and she's the founder of Northwestern Medicine Center for Menopause and the Northwestern Medicine Center for Sexual Medicine. Dr. Stryker is a medical correspondent for top-rated news programs in Chicago and has been a guest on other national shows like The Oprah Winfrey Show, CNN, CBS, 2020, just to name a few. Dr. Stryker is also a best-selling author. She's written several books, and she hosts the popular podcast called Dr. Stryker's Inside Information Podcast, Menopause, Midlife, and More. Welcome, Dr. Stryker. It's a pleasure to be back. Anything new? What's different on the horizon coming up? Birth control? Yeah. Give us the landscape. Well, first, let me tell you that there, there are always new things, and I'm going to tell you about some very exciting new things. But I'm glad you started off with talking about larks, L-A-R-C, as you said, not L-A-R-K, which is the bird. And this is actually not a new term for us, new term for you, but we've been talking about long-acting reversible contraception for a long time. And the reason is, is that we are in an era right now, which it is more important than ever to have reliable contraception. Because when we talk about contraception, we not only look at user Preference, but we look at failure rates and we know that something that is not going to be controlled on a case by case basis is what's going to have the best rates of success. So when we look at a long acting reversible contraception, that is something that is not, as we say, user dependent. These are contraceptions that we set and forget. And as we go through the list of options for college students to use, that is certainly high on the list when it comes to the most reliable. But before we get to the specific contraceptions, I just want to kind of set the stage for why this is such an important conversation. Because, Please. yeah, absolutely, Dodge, no question. Even before the Dodge decision, when it became potentially life-threatening, you know, now it's, it's not just inconvenient or scary, it's life-threatening to become pregnant. But beyond that, we know that Women in college are very high risk for not only getting pregnant, but for getting a sexually transmitted infection. We're talking one in four women will contract a sexually transmitted infection. We know that most college women, about at least 70%, are sexually active. And when I'm talking sexually active, I am talking penile vaginal intercourse because sexually active, of course, can mean many things. Right? A lot of different things. But if we're talking about just the ability to get pregnant, we're looking at about 70 percent. Is people that just because you're more fertile in your 20s? It's a combination of increased fertility and it's a combination of complacency, of not using contraception on a consistent basis or using it correctly. And that's one of the things that is really the theme of today is I think many college women are very much aware of what's available to them. But just because they're using a contraception does not mean that they use it correctly. And in fact, if you look at statistics for unplanned pregnancies, roughly 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. And according to the Guttmacher Institute, 50% of those use some form of contraception in the month before. Now, think about that. It's really wild. You know, so many people think that if someone gets pregnant, 
It's because they were just complacent or they were lazy or they, the worst is when people actually think that some people use abortion for contraception, which is simply not true. 50% of unplanned pregnancies are people who did use some form of contraception, but it failed. And some methods are more likely to fail than others. And at the top of the list, quite frankly, are male condoms. I'm currently doing a study with the Kinsey Institute that I will tell you about with male condoms. And so I've been reading a lot about it and looking at these studies. And I was floored at the number of couples that even if they say, yeah, we use a condom, if they don't use them properly and they have incomplete use of condom, meaning they're not using a condom from the start to the finish of sex. And the question, re- though, in I- terms of preventing sexually transmitted infections, Am I correct that the condom, the condom was the best way or the only way? How uh, else can you prevent an infection? Okay, so let's switch gears for a little bit. We're going to switch from contraception to protection of STIs. So when we talk about STIs, the most common STI out there is human papillomavirus, right? Mm-hmm. Where women get human papillomavirus on the vulva. Do condoms protect their vulva? They do not. So when we look at condoms as protecting against STIs, It is one of the best methods that we have out there, but it is not the only method and it is not as protective as it needs to be because it is going to protect against cervical sexually transmitted infections, gonorrhea, chlamydia, things such as that, but it will not protect against herpes. It will not protect against HPV. And that's even if the condom is used properly. These studies, which completely, you know, just I was like blown away by it, is the number of men who do not use a condom from start to finish because of condom-associated erection problems, something we don't think about in young men, but certainly exists. They talk about... We've been hearing about it in a lot of our cases. Yeah. But I just want you to back up a little bit. Sure. Sure. I know with the HPV, we now have a vaccine. We don't have a vaccine that I'm aware of for herpes. So what's, what's a gal to do? Okay, well, first of all, let's circle back to the vaccine for a minute. I wish I could say that 100% of college age men and women have been vaccinated against HPV, but they have not. Some of them are also folks that were vaccinated earlier on so that they got the quadrivalent vaccine, meaning that it only protects against four subtypes of HPV, as opposed to the newer vaccine, which prevents against nine subtypes. So even people that were vaccinated, depending on when they were vaccinated, may not have complete protection, but there's an awful lot of people that aren't protected. And quite frankly, a lot of times it's the guys that aren't protected. But to your point, herpes, there is no vaccine and herpes is, has nothing to do with intercourse in many cases. It's about oral sex. There's this idea that type one herpes is on the mouth and type two herpes is on the genitals. And we know that's not the case. You can have both type one and type two on the mouth or the genitals because of transference during oral sex. So how do you protect yourself? Let's, I mean, I'm sure all the parents are sitting out there, people are saying, okay, get to it already. (laughs) Enough data, give us answers. Short of stepping in a hefty bag or locking yourself in your dorm room and becoming abstinent, which is not going to happen. So number one, there is a new product called Laurels, R-O-A-L-S. Are you familiar with this one? Yes. Yeah, Laurels is a disposable latex panty which is worn by a woman. And the purpose of laurels is to protect her during oral sex. So if a guy or a woman is giving her oral sex and uh, that person has herpes on their mouth or gonorrhea on their mouth, as you can, and uh, that means that this will protect her. It's latex. And this is a disposable panty. It's a one-use panty that is, does not decrease sensation. In fact, some people think it increases sensation. I actually have a whole podcast on it in my uh, Protecting Yourself podcast. And it's really an interesting new product. And the idea being that it also can be for anal play, not just for vaginal play, but it's not for penetration. It's not for penetration. What's new out there for penetration is there is a product which is about to get FDA cleared. I'm working with this company. It's very exciting. And it's called Louie, as in L-U-W-I, as in let us wear it. And what Louie is, 
is this is a woman-controlled, very important, a woman-controlled contraception for both pregnancy protection and STI protection. And this is a polyurethane single-use internal liner. So it's an internal sheet that protects the vagina, but it also protects the vulva. And this is inserted Hmm. the woman up to eight hours in advance, and she's not aware of it. The men are not aware of it. And the idea is, is that not only is it not going to decrease her pleasure, but it is going to protect from STIs, both in the vagina and the vulva. And what's interesting, and I mentioned I'm doing a study with the Kinsey Institute right now. The study that we're doing is specifically to identify couples that the man either doesn't use a condom or doesn't use it from start to finish in complete use because he says that it impacts on his sensation. It impacts on his ability to orgasm. He can't maintain his erection. He has discomfort with the condom. There's a whole long list of excuses, right? So what we want to see is with use of a woman-controlled contraception with Louie, are we going to cross all of those things off the guy's list? What's really interesting is, I don't know if you're familiar with ACHA, the American College Health Association. Are you familiar with this group? No. No. I just came from their conference. This is basically a group of all of the people that run student health care all over the country. So there are 700 different colleges that participate in ACHA. They have a conference every year, the American College Health Association Conference. It took place three weeks ago in Boston. I was there. And the reason that I was there is because we were introducing Louie to all of these college health student centers. And I got to tell you, the excitement was over the top. No pun intended, right? Yeah. No, really, because they are, what they do, the colleges buy condoms. And you're aware of that, that they buy yeah. condoms. Yeah, yes. No. Yes. And, but and they, and are they, they easy to use? And yes, can they, they get stuck in the well, vagina? Well, I was wondering, does it get stuck? Does like it float a, around? Can oh. it cause toxic shock? No, not at all. So if this wasn't a podcast, I would show it to you because I happen to have one right here with my purple sparkle vulva well, that we were using. Hold it up and we'll describe all it right, to hold our... Up. 10 seconds to step away and get my purple vulva. I got to see your purple vulva. And listeners (laughs) out there, we will describe the Louie Louie to you. Louie Louie. Uh, Louie Louie. Okay. Okay, Here we go. Okay. Carrying the bag. Right. Here we go. Here is my purple vulva. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can see the purple vulva. Here's the vaginal opening. Here's the clitoris just to orient you. Okay. And we made the vagina clear. So that you can see what happens inside. Okay. So this is Louie. It looks just like a condom, a male condom mixed up. It does look like a condom. It's exactly like a condom. So listeners out there, it actually looks like a condom. Yeah. Well, the difference is it's made out of polyurethane. And so what that means is it's much softer. It's much thinner. It doesn't decrease sensation. There's no odor. It doesn't have that funky latex odor. It's completely colorless. There's no color to it. And there's this very kind of soft, flexible ring. So basically, the way that it works is a woman just takes it and she just pushes this inside her vagina. Like a tampon? But not even. Yeah, but it doesn't have to go up as far. It's just like with her fingers, she just pushes it in. And then she takes this ring and she puts it right over her vulva. And then when the penis goes in, it pushes it in for her. It gets it in all the way. So then, but this is what's cool, is as you can see, it's over the vulva. And if you if someone touches it when it's thin, you can't. It doesn't decrease sensation at all. But the beauty is, is a lot of women position this ring right over this clitoris. You know where I'm going here. So what this means is that it's going to ensure that during intercourse, that the woman's not just going to have less pleasure, she will potentially have more pleasure. Studies also show that she'll have more pleasure because she won't be as worried. If someone isn't worried about getting an STI or getting pregnant, they have more pleasure. So this So this covers the vulva. And what this means is that if the guy has herpes or HPV, her vulva is protected. This can also be used for anal intercourse, male to male, female to male, same kind of protection instead of... What about lubrication? Does it block the lubrication? It comes with a lubrication. Okay. So the lubricant is inside and I mean, around the side of the outside of it, this one's unlubricated for demo purposes. Otherwise, my purple ball gets all greasy. And the recommendation is to use it lub- with a lubricant just because it's going to be easier. And in fact, the packaging will come with a lubricant. So 
when we went to this meeting and there was a tremendous amount of excitement because the healthcare services know more than anybody that there's all these STIs and undesired pregnancies and that this is really going to be a huge solution. They were all signing up to, to buy them for, to distribute on campuses. So the condom fairy, if the college, a lot of college campuses have condom fairies and all kinds of things that they go around and they're going to be distributing these. And it's not going to be for this school year because the FDA clearance is just coming through and they're just being manufactured. But we are looking at the 2024-25 school year. So that's the newest thing that's coming out that's very exciting. And the thing that's you exciting about it women is women have to worry about leakage when you pull no, it out? No. So this is part of the FDA clearance process. It's just like with the latex condom, they test it to make sure that sperm can't get through, that the STIs can't get through. And sure, like a male condom, if somebody pulls it off or doesn't use it or doesn't use it from the beginning, of course, there's always going to be a chance of there being a problem. But if it's properly used, you don't have that problem. And it's very, very easy to use. You know, there's been, it's been tested. We've looked at focus groups. It's launching, interestingly, it's for any age woman, but it's being launched on college campuses for a variety of reasons. And one of it is because they have one of the greatest unmet needs when it comes to protection. And again, people are not aware, you are, but the general population is not aware of incomplete condom use and improper condom use on the part of men. And even though a lot of these women do have, as we talked about, very reliable, long-acting, reversible contraception that's not user-dependent, that's not going to protect them against an STI. Oh, I love IUDs. I think every single woman should have one, 99% protection against pregnancy, but that is not going to protect her against a sexually transmitted infection. Wow. Dr. Stryker bringing us the latest cutting-edge developments in contraception. Yeah. When there's discussion and debate between birth control oh, and abortion. Yeah. And obviously, again, it, in the wake of Dobbs, it's really important that listeners and, and everyone out there is aware of the distinction between the two because there's often a lot of conflation. And so can you clearly explain for our listeners whether an IUD or an emerg or emergency contraception, Plan B. do they cause yeah. abortion? What is the so, difference between? Uh, and I'm glad we're discussing it because there is a great deal of misconception and has been from the get-go. And one of the reasons historically is that emergency contraception, the first morning after pill, came out about the same time as we started having medical abortions. So it was very confusing and they are very different things. And to put it very simply, there's a difference between terminating an established pregnancy, that's when abortion is, versus preventing pregnancy. So if you look at emergency contraception, that is basically preventing pregnancy from occurring. It is not an abortion. And it's something that we have been using for decades, even before they had an FDA-approved option available, because it was something that gynecologists did off-label meaning we would use a combination of standard birth control pills given within a short time after unprotected sex, particularly in emergency rooms. When someone would come in as a victim of rape and you don't want them to get pregnant, of course, so we would give them our version of emergency contraception. And so fast forward, now here we are, that we have much more reliable and FDA-approved emergency contraception. So we have emergency contraception pills, which we don't call the morning after pills anymore, because there's this idea that if you don't take it the morning after, that it's not going to work. And we know that's not the case. The sooner you take it, the better, ideally within 72 hours. But you do have up to five days to, to use emergency contraception. But the, we've had cases where they don't work. So we've right, heard not, that they don't work if you're ovulating. Is that true? No, it does. It can work because this is the time frame. When someone ovulates, the egg is released from the ovary. It then travels down the fallopian tube. If a sperm meets up with that egg in the fallopian tube, that's actually where the sperm penetrates the egg. And then it makes that trip down the fallopian tubes, and then it lands in the uterus, where if there's a nice cushy bed that's comfortable and waiting for this <laughs> potential pregnancy, it's going to land and it's going to embed. But that's why you have, even if you have sex, the moment you're ovulating, you've got this five-day window before it's going to travel down and become an established pregnancy. So again, it is not a pregnancy, a viable pregnancy until it lands in the uterus. So the same can be said for IUDs. We now know 
the placement of an intrauterine device within five days of unprotected intercourse is going to dramatically decrease the rate of an unintended pregnancy. And then the beauty of the IUD then is you could just leave it there and you're protected going forward. And that's critically important because in this world of Dobbs, not only is abortion at risk, but so is contraception. And I think mm-hmm. it's very, very clear about that is that when we're looking at productive rights in these states that are passing these insane anti-woman laws, it's not just about their ability to get an abortion. It is about the ability to get contraception. And so my advice to women who are looking for reliable contraception is quite frankly, almost basically 100% of women are candidates for an intrauterine device. And the beauty of that is that no one can take away your IUD, no matter what laws pass. So if you get placement of an IUD, you're going to be good for up to eight years, maybe even a little bit longer as far as contraception. So how does the plan B fail? Well, if it fails, if it's taken too late, it can fail. And the other thing also is that most of these contraceptive methods are not 100%. Even if you look at a lot of the user-dependent methods like birth control pills or the patch or the ring, we know that these are not 100% effective because there's theoretical effectiveness, which is very different than typical use failure rates. Typical use failure rates are higher. So for example, if you look at birth control pills and you think, how can birth control pills fail? 7% of the time they do. And you one of to take it, you go to you bed. Eat, and you, yeah. Exactly. And the other thing also is the most common time to miss a pill. You know when that is? During your period? No, it's the beginning of a new pack. And oh, 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 that's interesting. Yeah. And the reason why is some insurance companies and some healthcare student healthcare systems, they're not going to give you 12 packs. They say you got to come in every month. Well, who's busier than a college student? Who has less access to getting to the pharmacy than a college student? So they go off their pill for their five days or seven days, depending on the pill. It's time to start the new pill. They've got a final. They've got something to coming up. They say, I'm not going to make it there. So instead of starting their new pill pack on a Sunday, they might start it on Tuesday. And that's the greatest likelihood of having a failure is at the beginning. I am a huge, huge advocate of continuous pill taking, meaning There is no off days. There's no placebo days. There's no period. Get your pill. Take an active pill every single day because not only are you not going to get a period, which is a wonderful thing for all the obvious reasons, get rid of the cramps, the expensive tampons. The list is very long of of advantages to not having a period. But the other advantage that people really don't appreciate is that your your failure rate is going to be lower because it's with starting that new pack that people ovulate. And quite frankly, when you send your student off to college, one of the best things you can do is forget insurance, purchase a couple of extra packs of pill, Mm -hmm. send them off with some extra packs. So if they go away for the weekend and they forget it or get flushed down the toilet or whatever, you want to make sure that that you're going to have some extra pill packs and that they can take them continuously without worrying about it. And the same is even like with the ring. You know, when you look at the Nuva Ring and Anna Vera, are you familiar with those two? Yes. Uh, and people may not be familiar with Anna Vera, which is a vaginal ring with estrogen and progestin in it that can be used for up to a year. And the recommendation on the part of the manufacturer and the FDA approval is you remove it one week a month to get your period. And I'm like, are you kidding? Don't remove it, for God's sakes. Put it in and leave it there for a year. And just don't even think about it. And, it's, and that's the state that's healthy? Absolutely. But they didn't. But for a variety of reasons, the FDA did not did not okay it for that. And the company didn't try and get it through because it's really not about medical. It's more about that. It's just it's perfectly safe to take your pill continuously. It's perfectly safe to leave your ring in. If you want to take it out, you can take it out for a couple of hours, rinse it with cold water, put it back. But every time you take it out is a chance for it to get lost, for it to get forgotten, and for not to be put back in time. So maybe if you want to take it out and get a light period, don't take it out for the whole week. Take it out for two, three days and put it back. It's a lot of this. It doesn't have to always be done by the book. There's ways to to use these different methods of contraception so that you will decrease the failure rate based on some of the real life situations that come up. Christina, I just thought about the funniest thing prepared for this podcast. Did you watch Seinfeld? 
I did. Loved it. Do you remember Elaine and saying, is someone sponge worthy? Oh, yes. Do you remember? Yes. So, so we're old enough. We know about sponges, but the college students certainly don't know about sponges. So do you think now it's going to be, are you Louis worthy? The thing is that it could be, but the idea is to make this stuff easily attainable and affordable. Absolutely. It became sponge worthy was because they were so hard to get. And and expensive. For affording them. But the idea, particularly on college campuses, is you want it to be as easy as buying a pack of gum is to have access to reliable contraception. It shouldn't have to be Louis worthy. It shouldn't have to be condom worthy. It should be just in case worthy. I'm I love put that. This in because I don't know what's going to happen tonight. But in the event that something does happen, I sure don't want to wake up tomorrow morning and think, oh my God, what did I, you know, what just happened there? And obviously we wish that there weren't situations where people had too much to drink and where there was non-consensual sex, but let's talk real life. Let's talk what's going on in campuses. And if a woman goes to a party or is out drinking, even if she has no intention of having sex, if she can place something in her vagina that is going to protect against both STIs and pregnancy, think of the peace of mind. Think of the anguish that young women go through the morning after. When sometimes they're not even sure of something. Now, how long can that stay in you, the Louis? Eight hours. You can put it in eight hours in advance. Okay. So mm-hmm. it's not something that a young woman should keep in her backpack or purse and then run to the bathroom. It should be something put in oh. before. You no, know, no, she could put it in 10 but seconds. You can do both. Yeah. yeah. But you can have it in up to eight hours. But you can absolutely keep it in your backpack. And, and everyone should. And... It's, I really think it's going to change the landscape because not only do you get the increased protection, but let's face it, historically, it all comes down to being women controlled. Always has been. You've shared so much information with us today. And and I think our listeners have learned a lot, hopefully, by listening to this episode. I want to clear up one piece of information that I hear often and regularly, and it's been going around for an eternity. And that is, oh, I don't want to go on birth control because it's going to make me gain weight. Yeah. Myth Uh, or fact? Total myth, total myth. And this isn't my opinion. This is based on literally millions of women over long periods of time in, you know, multiple, multiple studies that the average weight gain at most with a birth control pill is like two pounds and the majority of them, there is none. And the reason women gain weight when they go off to college is all the reasons. Yeah, that's everything. It's an unlimited meal plan. Not alcohol. Alcohol. (laughs) Alcohol is actually a a huge factor because I think that the college students forget about not only how many calories there are in alcohol, but you kind of lose your willpower when you're sitting there drinking. You're also... That's true at any age. That's my (laughs) menopause excuse, too. It's I'm not out. the red wine. <laughs> okay. And this was a great episode. I do think it's going to make them gain weight. It will not. But there are so many other options. And I really do believe that an IUD is critically important for young women of all ages. But I want one other little fact that you may not know that's so interesting is there's the executive director of the Kinsey Institute, Justin Garcia. He is the consultant for Match.com. And every year they do an analysis of what people are looking for on online dating, as many students will do. And what what are the factors? All of them, right. And they found for the first time ever that being anti-choice was a deal breaker for a record number of women. Isn't that interesting? I am so happy you didn't let us stop this podcast until you got that out. That's a great fact. That's a beautiful and interesting fact. And I well, a, wow. A whole episode with Dr. Garcia talking about all the match findings. And it is really interesting. But I love that one because it, it means women are paying attention and changing their behaviors based on it. Well, thank mm-hmm. you so much for your time today and all the wonderful information you've shared. It's always such a pleasure to you have you on. No, we're going to ask you back because me time. wealth of information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Real Talk with Susan and Christina. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. And leave us a review so other people can find the content we share here. You can follow us on Instagram. Just search our handle, at StoneSoupler. And for more resources, visit us online at studentdefense.kjk.com. Thank you so much for being a part of our Real Talk community. We'll see you next time.